was Brad Brown out actually right about the ACC being a better basketball conference than the Big 12? Maybe. This, this is Locked On Baylor. You are Locked On Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello there and welcome in to another edition of Locked on Baylor. I am your host, Cam Stewart from ESPN Central Texas. Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. Ooh, if you're watching on YouTube, I think I've got golden hour going on. This is perfect. The sun's starting to peek through. I look great, except for the enormous forehead I have going on. Anyway, today's show, we are talking some basketball including the Big 12 as a whole, not just Baylor, and where those shortcomings are coming from when it, the calendar turns to the middle of March and into March Madness. Why aren't Big 12 teams going as far as they were a couple years ago? And could the worst person you know have made a great point? Possibly. Uh, we'll also be talking about a potential addition to the Baylor basketball coaching staff. Now, this is me appointing the person, but I think you could see a guy who was playing at Baylor the last couple of years get into the coaching realm. I don't think it's that crazy. And then, in addition to the class of 2025 for the Baylor football program, they are currently number two in the 2025 recruiting rankings for the entire Big 12. They added uh, another nice player, three-star, but a nice player uh, earlier this week. Starting with NCAA tournament time, you'll recall a time a few months ago when Brad Brownell said the Big 12 is manipulating the net rankings and that the ACC actually deserves more respect and that the ACC should have more teams in the tournament. And we, and I will definitely include myself at the front of this line, me, we laughed at this comment like oh sour grapes the big 12 is such a good conference that now they're just making things up in the acc and this is as mid as the acc has been in a long time and so we we were like come on man what are you even doing you're grasping at straws here i made this whole slam about how you know the acc ain't even near what the big 12 is now and yet at elite eight weekend it was acc three and Big 12, nothing. And in the final four, the ACC will have a representative. And of course, the Big 12 will not. So what's going on here? Was Brad Brownell right? Kind of. Kind of. I'll start with this. What he's specifically talking about with the net rankings, I don't think is right. I don't think the Big 12 has come in here and colluded to play crappy teams in order to get the net rankings up to get more of their teams into, into the NCAA tournament. Don't think that's true. You look at the paper and the schedule, and that's not true. Like, they still schedule pretty tough, especially we looked at Duke, or excuse me, Baylor, who scheduled Duke and Michigan State and, and Seton Hall, a team that should have been in the tournament. And, you know, so it's not like they were just playing a bunch of nobodies. They weren't. Um, and you could say that for any number of teams in the Big 12. So is he right about that part? I don't think so. Don't think he's right there. Maybe his greater point, though, is the ACC deserves some more respect. And in that case, you have to say he's right. They get only four teams into the tournament, and it's not a good start for the ACC because Virginia should not have been in there, and they showed that. They proved that in the first four when they got annihilated by Colorado State leaving three teams in there, and all three teams from the ACC make it to the Elite Eight. So, is he right about that? Yes, he is. He's right. The big the, the ACC deserved some more respect. Do I think it should have gotten them extra bids? Probably probably not, but it's something you got to think about. Like, Pitt, Pitt was actually probably a better team most of the year than Virginia, so maybe they should have gotten a bid. By the way, they beat all three of those teams that made it to the Elite Eight. So maybe they should. And for the Big 12, there's no excuse. You still are, on paper, the best basketball conference in America. But when all the eyes are upon you, you failed two years in a row. There's been one Elite Eight team in the Big 12 the last two years. And that team's not going to be in the conference next year. So there's no excuse for the Big 12's failures 
when it comes to the NCAA tournament. And the fact that you only had two teams advancing in the second weekend and neither of them winning in the Sweet 16, that's embarrassing, man. That That is... And, and Baylor's included in that by not even making it to the Sweet 16. That all together, that is embarrassing. That's a terrible look for our league. And I was trying desperately, like all day today and yesterday, trying to find out what it is. And I haven't found a good answer yet of why the ACC, even at their most mid, has been able to consistently get pretty far in the tournament the last couple of years, and specifically the last two years when the Big 12 stopped sending teams to the Final Four, the ACC teams have done better than the Big 12. And I, I don't I don't know exactly what it is. The ACC's got terrific coaches. So does the Big 12. The ACC plays a physical brand of basketball. So does the Big 12. The, AC, the ACC has plenty of resources and is able to get the top-end talent. So can the Big 12. And in fact, when I'm still looking at the Big 12, the teams at the bottom of that conference are still better than the bottom teams in the ACC. So by that measurement, I would still think that this conference, our conference, the truck stop conference is better. But when push comes to shove, you care about how your team's doing the NCAA tournament and the ACC goes farther than the Big 12 does. And it's not a case of one or two programs being way above the rest because NC State isn't in that upper tier. They're in the Final Four. Clemson is not in that upper tier. They went to the Elite Eight and beat a Big 12 team to get there. So for the specific answer, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I think the ACC puts a little bit more emphasis, or at least these programs put a little bit more emphasis on getting shot makers and shot creators in there. And I've said this plenty of times. That's what wins in the NCAA tournament. You still have to play some defense, but... I think overall, the Big 12 is littered with teams that don't have great shot creators, but play terrific defense and are able to make the league a slugfest because of that. I look at Kansas State. You know, Tyler Perry's a good scorer, but other than that, they are a slug it out defensive team that'll try and keep you under 60 and win that way. Texas Tech is that way, and they're losing their best shot creator in Pop Isaacs, uh, a team that didn't quite make the tournament but has certainly embodied the Big 12 style of play is, is um, who is it? Cincinnati. Cincinnati. They don't have a shot maker on that team yet. Um, and, and so I'm like, maybe that's, maybe that's it. Maybe it's as simple as that. And it's just the teams that focus on offense are are there longer. But then I thought more into that because there's really three or four teams that I can think of in the Big 12 that uh, have dynamic offenses, right? Kansas, when they're at full strength, which they weren't at the end of the year, but Kansas, Baylor, Texas, BYU. None of those teams made it to the Sweet 16. None of them. And instead, you see more of these long, athletic, defensive-minded teams that do really well. The top two teams in our conference, Houston, Iowa State, they didn't make it past the Sweet 16. So I don't know what the final verdict is here, but the ACC is taking the Big 12's lunch in the NCAA tournament. So I have to eat those words about Brad Brownell, who did a terrific job this year. And, and, you know, these, these teams don't have one and dones. I mean, you have a high end talent, like an RJ Davis and Armando Baycott for North Carolina, and they get to the sweet 16, but like, who is the really high end talent for Clemson? No disrespect to them, but they don't have that. And they went a step further than Carolina. So I, I don't know if it's a perfect storm of things, but this is two straight years that the big 12 hasn't had a team in the final four. And this year did not even have a team in the elite eight what, eight or nine bids into the tournament and didn't have one of those teams going the Elite Eight, even the one that was like wire-to-wire -wire top five in Houston, that's a terrible look. A terrible look to the Big 12. And right now, you have to say, yes, once again, history buffs rejoice. The ACC is better than the Big 12 
in terms of winning in the tournament right now. And one way to keep up with all the ACC, all the Big 12, all the NCAA tournament is through our friends at Amazon Fire TV. That's how I keep up to date with all my sports because it's your destination for live games, highlights, in-depth analysis, all of that. You can use it through their smart TVs, which gives you all those multi-views. It's a great experience. Or you can do what I do. Use the Fire TV stick, plug it into your existing TV, bring it on the road with you, take it home with you anywhere, and you can still have access to all those millions of of TV shows and movies and free and live TV. It's all available there. So, you know, we're obviously in the second week of the baseball season. That's fully underway. We're about to get into NBA, NHL playoffs, NCAA tournaments still going on, both the men's and the women's. This is the way to keep up. In fact, they recently created Fire TV channels that deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from all your sports brands, all for free. And that includes all of us. In fact, I just saw it on my Amazon Fire TV before I did this episode. I could go to the Locked On channel and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. So check out the Fire TV channels on Fire TV and your Alexa devices. And if you haven't checked out these channels, you need to. Trust me on this. To learn more, go to amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. That's amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. So we know the Big 12 has plenty of good basketball coaches still and plenty of good basketball players. And actually, let me just start by saying this. I get a lot of a lot of things tick me off as a sports fan that other sports fans do uh, because I'm such a snob about it. And one of the things is I hate when fans are like, oh, this player played point guard and didn't turn it over a lot. That player should be a coach. Or, or you know, th- this player gets emotional. He, he should be a coach. I see him being a coach one day. I hate it because we have no idea as fans who should be coaches and who should not be. Like, there's no, there's no real rhyme or reason to it. You know, if you look at the history of, we'll stick with college basketball, Like John Wooden was an all American in college, becomes a great coach. Mike Krzyzewski played at army, became a great head coach. So there's no one thing we can point to and be like, oh, because this guy does this, he'd be a great coach, right? You know, the the best coach in the history of football played center at Wesleyan in division three and was more known for being a captain of the lacrosse team. So I just hate when fans throw that out there that, Oh, this guy should be a coach. You don't know. You don't know. But every so often there, there are those players out there that you look at and everyone's like, you know, from all we've heard, what we've seen and how their coach talks to them, maybe they should be a coach. And I have had this feeling for the first time, for the first time with a Baylor basketball player this year, Jonathan Chamwachachua should be a basketball coach, preferably at Baylor. He has an innate knowledge for the game, and I think what's great about it is he is very naturally a student of the game because he hasn't been playing all that long when when you take in his whole you know, 23, 24 years of life into account. He hasn't been playing all that long, but he's learned every step of the way. And Scott Drew has called him you know, his one of his favorite ever players to to coach. And I think that that holds a lot of weight. And for us as fans, I mean, I think I speak for all of us Baylor fans by saying we we cannot thank Jonathan Chamwachachua enough for his contribution to the program. Um, He said it on senior night. You know, he just says, I think I left this place a little bit better than I found it. And I can say unequivocally, Jonathan, you are exactly right. In fact, if you take into the context the years that he was here, and this is not a diss to anybody else, but the rise of the program since he got here, there are very few players in Baylor history that can say that more unequivocally than than Jonathan can. Uh, Even the year he couldn't play, he was redshirting in 2019-20, all the guys on those teams were saying he 
he helped us out immensely in practice. Freddie Gillespie was saying he helped me out in practice. And, you know, all the stories where he was the one that got the guys out of their apartments and into the gym or working out, working out outside when they needed to during COVID, he was the one that got everybody out there. And he is obviously an emotional leader for the team. You know, uh, it takes me back to those videos of when he could barely walk after that injury and he's sitting in a chair and putting up shots to stay fresh. Uh, and obviously his emotional return to come back from that injury that I think at the time, a lot of people doubted he could ever come back from. And then when you heard the stories afterwards, you were like, how on earth is this guy playing basketball? He came back from that in exactly a year, 52 weeks. Um, that is incredible. So that shows already a commitment to the game that goes beyond even what the average college basketball player does, which by the way, the average player has an incredible commitment to the game. But Jonathan Chamuchachua took it that extra step by working his way back, the walking miracle. And I think the thing that did it for me was actually also on that senior night before he uh, made that announcement afterwards of like, hey, I hope I left it better than than I found it. You did. You won a national championship, a couple of Big 12 championships, Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. It was earlier that night on senior night where Baylor played one of its worst halves of the whole year. And we're lucky to only be down nine against Texas. They had given up 49 points in that first half. And apparently, and I wish we had audio or video of this, Jonathan Chamuchachua was the one taking taking the podium, so to speak, in the locker room, urging his teammates on to get back in that game. And to a man, you could see that out there. You could see a possessed Baylor team, a much more motivated Baylor team, and they took it to UT in that second half. They came back and then some. They came all the way back and to the point where UT had to foul them at the end because Baylor was in complete control of that game. Jonathan Chamwachachua is the one who sparked that. And there was something that was caught by the Baylor Plus cameras, I believe it was after the Kansas game, which would have been the game before, where Scott Drew is calling out Everyday John in a good way in the locker room saying, hey, we needed, we needed John. You know, we needed his help and his guidance. And then he says, and John, it's one thing for us, the coaches, to say it, but when your teammates are saying it, that they needed you and that you helped them, that's a whole nother thing. And that that's what kind of does it for me. That's a guy who is obviously a great servant leader, and that's what a great coach should be. He fits all that mold. He's 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 a learner, he is a teacher. He's got a ton of class and a ton of passion, and he just does things the right way. Anyone should want him to be a coach on their team because of all of those things. And I actually asked, when we were in Memphis, I asked Eve Misi. I said, hey, you know, it's how was it like playing in your first tournament game? This is before the Clemson game. And, you know, he said, you know, it was a bit of an adjustment, but, you know, I really liked it. And I said, you know, how much is has Jonathan helped you? He was in the locker right next to him. I said, how much has Jonathan helped you? And he says, he helps me every day. Like I, I wouldn't be able to be in the spot that I'm in, but for Jonathan Chamuchachua. He said, he helps me and Josh, Josh O immensely every day. And he has gotten us ready for every next opponent. He's gotten us ready for college basketball. He's gotten us ready for the big 12. And he certainly got us ready for the tournament. So his commitment this year, knowing that he wasn't going to play the minutes that he was able to in the past, Jonathan Chamuachachu essentially became a GA this year. So, I, I again, I hate when people just see a player and say, that guy's smart, he should be a coach. But no doubt in my mind, Jonathan Chamuachachu should be a basketball coach. And I'm hoping he's doing it at Baylor. I would not be surprised in the next couple of years if we see Jonathan Chamuachachua back on Scott Drew's bench, but wearing the quarter zip and leading Baylor to some high highs once again, and hopefully leaving the program when he does eventually leave the program 
even better than he found it once again. But that'll be a tough act to follow because he already did so much as a player. Today's episode of Locked on Baylor is brought to you by FanDuel. Sports calendar is loaded. It truly is. We're getting in the best time of year here in April and May for sports fans. And FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action. Because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 you can use to bet on the tourney. MLB, NBA, NHL, playoffs, so much more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a big win. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, to make that big win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. It's also commitment season, kind of in football, and Baylor got some nice news on that front earlier this week, and that is through Christopher Johnson, not a running back for the Tennessee Titans who rushed for 2,000 yards that one year. No, Christopher Johnson, the 2025 edge rusher out of Alvin, Iowa Colony out there in the foray. This kid is kind of a beast and still moving up. He is a three-star, so... Uh, you know, not one of those highest echelon kind of recruits, but one that we have seen the, a caliber of recruit that we see turn into a, a pretty darn good player when Baylor is at their best. In, in fact, this is not by any means apples to apples because of their positions and plenty of other things, but three star, that level of high school football in that general area of the state, that's where you get. Jalen Petrie, that's where you get Terrell Bernard. Those are both three-star guys. So, again, this guy's an edge rusher. He's not a linebacker or anything like that. But I'm just saying, it's not like there's no precedent for Baylor to turn these guys into terrific players. And I say he's a beast in growing because he is growing. 6'3", 250. And he'll line up a bit inside, but he is an edge guy. And what he is able to use in high school is just a ton of strength from what I saw in his highlights. Not that he's not quick, but kind of raw in terms of the moves. He has great hands and is able to overpower a lot of offensive linemen out there in the foray. He was the 12 foray defensive lineman of the year, his junior season this past year in 2023, um, and was able to tally 59 tackles, 18 tackles for loss, nine sacks and two forced fumbles. There's a party in the backfield every week. And that man is the host. He loves getting an opponent's backfield. And what I noticed in his highlights, and again, this is for a high school football, but I think something that's positive in terms of the athletic ability you can work with is he is an edge guy and is great at getting to the quarterback, but he is not just that. He's got good lateral movement. He's good at chasing a ball carrier. He'll he'll chase running backs down. He'll fight off double teams to get a running back in the backfield. That that's what separates guys like you know Sean Oakman who could do that versus some of those pass rush specialists like a a Gabe Hall, so to speak. And that's not a diss on either of them. Those are both two terrific players at the college level. Uh, but Sean Oakman got a lot of draft buzz because he was able to do both those things. And Gabe Hall is getting still draft buzz, but he's seen as a pass rusher. Um, So Christopher Johnson, a name to look out for. Uh, What I think is most interesting about this is it's the first commitment nabbed by Anoke Brechterfield, the new defensive line coach. Um, Interesting to note that Baylor was the first offer that Christopher Johnson got. So that would have been under, under uh, Dennis Johnson, who was making that initial pitch as the defensive line coach. Now he's off to the Baltimore Ravens. And okay, Brechterfield comes in. Uh, he's a guy who's been everywhere. The Johnny Cash of defensive line coaches and is one that's coached under Dave Aranda. And clearly that was one where Brechterfield came in and said, this kid needs to still be on our radar. He still needs to be one of our top priorities at this position. And it it couldn't have been easy because you had schools like Houston and Kansas State in the Big 12 that were also hard on his trail and after his signature. 
And an okay, Brechterfield was able to get that across the line and get the Christopher Johnson commit. Uh, no doubt, it, it is kind of a not the hottest time to see people committing here at the beginning of April, but that's probably pretty understandable. He's a kid who's a junior. He's got some good teams coming after him, and there's a change to the position coach, and an okay, Brechterfield was able to keep him on board. So I think that's positive. I think that's positive from a Baylor positional coach standpoint. And it's great for this 2025 class, which just keeps moving up the rankings for Baylor. Uh, it's not the guy who's going to headline the class, but certainly one who is a welcome addition and one that Baylor can absolutely develop like they have done in the past. So again, number two in the 2025 Big 12 football recruiting rankings, yours, mine, our Baylor Bears. Let me know what you think about this commitment. Or if you have any thoughts on it, okay, Brechterfield, which we, who we are going to hear from in the next week or two, uh, drop that down in the comments below. Also, if you have an answer for why the ACC is doing so much better than the Big 12 is in the NCAA tournament, please drop that down in the comments below. Because they've, they've obviously done really well over the last couple of years. Two, twice in the last three years, the ACC team has knocked out Baylor. And they've both been kind of surprise stories. Clemson this year and UNC back in 2022, that, that team was an eight seed that made it to the national championship game. And with the talent they had on the roster, they should not have been an eight seed. So what is it? What is the, is it the way they play? Is it the team building? Please let me know if you have an answer down in the comments below. And whether you think Everyday John should be on the Baylor coaching staff, unless you're saying yes, it's a wrong answer, but drop that down in the comments section below too. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe. We are the only place that is giving you nothing but Baylor Athletics content every single day that's not coming straight from the university. So we thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. We'll be back tomorrow with your favorite show, Locked On Baylor.